Hi, I'm James. And I'm Anthony. And this is Words and Numbers, presented by FEE, the Foundation for Economic Education. What's new and exciting in your world this weekend? And before you answer, I'm going to bet anything that I have three things that are more fascinating than your one thing. So let's hear it. Well, they won't be more fascinating to me. That's really not the standard we use here. <laughs> As an economics professor, one of my greater annoyances is people who equate success in business with a knowledge of economics. It's no different than equating success in sports with a knowledge of physiology or equating success in gardening with a knowledge of botany. Warren Buffett is a repeat offender here. Years ago, he famously declared that his secretary paid more in taxes than he did. What a load of nonsense that was. Come yeah. On. People who equated Buffett's success in business for knowledge of economics latched on to this and started calling for the rich to pay their fair share. The problem, of course, is that this was completely false. Buffett gained much of his income from capital gains, and capital gains are taxed at a lower rate than wage income. But capital gains reflect company profits, or the anticipation of profits, and those profits are taxed. Further, to obtain capital gains in the first place, one must invest money that one has earned, ultimately, from labor. So while Buffett's secretary pays income and payroll tax on money she earns from working, Buffett paid income and payroll taxes when he earned the money he originally invested, paid profits tax when the company in which he invested earned profits, then paid capital gains tax when that after-tax profit increased the value of his investments. In total, Buffett pays far more in taxes, both in total and percentage terms, than his secretary. And here, we have Buffett again, saying at Berkshire Hathaway's annual shareholder meeting recently that business taxes don't get passed on to consumers. Nonsense. Oh, that's what a bunch of nonsense. Can you that believe is. that? Now, come it's, on. It's possible. I looked up the numbers. It's possible that this is true in Berkshire Hathaway's case as their profit margin averages, averages a whopping 11%. Yeah, they're doing pretty well over there. Yeah, yeah, really. Now, Berkshire Hathaway can certainly afford to pay more taxes, though just because it can afford to do so doesn't mean that it won't pass on tax hikes to consumers. Because here's the thing, at Berkshire Hathaway has a responsibility, a primary responsibility to its shareholders. Exactly. It's a breach of fiduciary responsibility not to try and pass that off. It absolutely is. And if I'm in the shareholders meeting and Warren gets up and says, well, we're just going to pay this out of the profits this year. As a shareholder, I'm going to have some strongly worded statements for him. <laughs> <All right. laughs> Do you ever have any statements that aren't strongly worded, James? <laughs> Sometimes when I first get up. So here's Berkshire Hathaway, averaging an 11% profit margin. The average U.S. company earns just a 6% profit margin. That's low enough that it's almost a certainty that the typical U.S. business will pass on tax hikes to consumers. The alternative, paying the tax out of their 6% profit margin, would drop their profits to the point that in many cases, investors would be better off liquidating the company and investing their money elsewhere. And, you know, we saw this, what, just a month or two ago when grocery stores were hit, yep. with, I believe it was in California, where else? were hit with an additional tax. And what did they do? They shut down a bunch of grocery stores. It wasn't a tax. It was Long Beach requiring that the grocery stores pay their workers an extra something, $2 or $4 an hour. Sure, but you call that what you will. It's a tax. Yeah, yeah. It's the same effect. And they shut down. Well, how could you not? They, they run a 3% margin business and all of a sudden employee costs have skyrocketed. Because not only do they have to pay the money there, the $2, they have to pay all of the Social Security and Medicare taxes on right. top of that. After all of this, Buffett went on to say that when he dies, he would rather leave his money to philanthropic causes, but that if the government took it all, it wouldn't bother him. Well, that's just great that's for Warren Buffett. Exactly. The, the rest of us might give a damn about that sort of thing. That's easy for someone worth $110 billion to say. But the families that own the more than 5 million family businesses that could be forced to close if the Biden administration augments the death tax might think otherwise. Warren Buffett's a strange case, right? Because it's almost impossible not to admire his abilities. His abilities are legendary for oh, a reason. Oh, yeah, absolutely. He, he, no question. He has really been something else. 
And yet this is kind of like what Socrates talked about, right? I met the shoemakers and they <laughs> thought they were great at everything. They, they were great at making shoes and so on and so forth. Warren Buffett doesn't know his ass from a hole in the ground in any number of ways here. And this is just really, really silly. He should cut it out. Yeah. But I predicted that I would have three things more interesting than your one thing. And I do. They're so interesting that I have to mention a couple of them, even though we're not going to talk about okay. it. First, I was sure you were going to talk about this. China lands on the moon. Really? You're not aware of the Chinese space program? Yet? No, 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 no. I, I was aware that they landed something on the backside of the moon, but that was like a year ago. They're on the moon right now, and they're going to bring back some rocks and stuff. And do you mean people? No, they don't have people up there yet. It's automated. Okay. But they have another thing on the moon right now. So they obviously some value in this that our country doesn't. Second, in the same vein and following up on something that we've talked about before, something that I got a lot of weird hate mail over, weirdos out there, just because I'm going to talk about this doesn't mean I'm a weirdo like you. <laughs> just means I'm going to talk about this. He's not that cool. No, I'm really not. Mind you, this is from the U.S. Sun. This is not the kind of place you want to go for your really good information. It's a bit of a rag. But the headline, look at that thing. U.S. Navy vid shows UFO whizzing through the sky before dropping into ocean. As ex-pilot says, military sees them all the time. It covers some reports that are apparently about to be declassified. So remember I said we were being prepared for something? Yeah, you called this. The preparation continues. But now we finally get to the actual thing we're going to talk about. And that's from the New York Times. And again, I'll read the headline. Mask? No mask, new rules leave Americans recalibrating hour by hour. Look, Ed, I've said a number of times to the great consternation of the people who listen to this podcast and who are on Words and Numbers backstage that I wear a mask all the time when I go out in public. And I don't do it because I think I need to for my own health. And surely after being vaccinated, I don't. But that I do this to keep my fellow citizens happy and calm. It's a low cost way to make people happy. Oh, no, Ant, it's almost a no-cost way. But it's not a no-cost way. And sooner or later, this business is to end. And what I've noticed lately is that most Americans, in fact, want it to end. Most Americans say either I'm vaccinated or other people are vaccinated enough or I never thought this was a problem in the first place. I'm cognizant of every reason people give. I think sooner or later, and it's going to be sooner, we're all going to have to say, okay, what should we do? And that's where we are right now. And the New York Times, of all places, is offering, I think, rational discourse on this matter, which is not like them. I've been thinking lately that I think I'm done with masks now. I know my fellow citizens still want me to wear them. And I've noticed a very clear pattern. Rational people are saying everything I just said. Right. But there's a group of crazies out there who literally want masks to be with us for the rest of all time. And I don't understand that because, look, either the vaccine works or it doesn't. If it does work, that's right. then we don't need the masks. If it doesn't work, why are we messing with the vaccine at all? Yeah, there you go. And, you know, I'm starting to realize, again, I realize this every time a public issue gets to a fever pitch, that there's a non-trivial number of citizens who actually enjoy exerting their will over their fellow citizens. To that group of people, I'm here to say, shut up go back in your house and leave the rest of us alone because it's been a year and a half and I'm just tired of it. I did my part. I encouraged everybody else to do the same. And from here on out, I'm leaving my mask at home. So if you don't like it, you stay at your house. Which, of course, Ant, brings us to the foolishness of the week. Ant, you're the foolishness of the week. <laughs> <laughs> that can't be right. <laughs> yeah, well, it's, it's absolutely right. I am a little bit. But you are without question. And we always say that, you know, we'll get back to you when something we say turns out to be, you know, dramatically incorrect. Right. And people should notice that we don't come back very often to say that we might have been mistaken on something. I but have a feeling that's going to change here. <laughs> right now, right here. Yep. You might remember, oh God, it must have been at least a year ago, maybe more, that you talked about that dude, the janitor who invented Flaming Hot Cheetos? Yes, of course. Remember, he worked his way right up and ended up as like a corporate VP, right. something like this? Right, right. Uh, yeah, it turns out that whole story is nonsense. <gasps> really? No, none of it ever happened. You're kidding and me. It, no, it was the most interesting thing I'm going to read all day. He's written a couple of memoirs that, of course, put this as the pivotal moment in his life. 
except there's nobody at Frito-Lay who ever remembered seeing him. Oh, wow. How did he get that out? Because I saw that not just in one place. I saw multiple references to it in what appeared to be source information. Sure. Well, when you write a book that details the thing and you give it to the publisher, the publisher fact checks the entire thing, as long as it's a real publisher. They find things like this out before it gets out of hand. But apparently it was a perfect storm of details because this guy started making these claims. And just as he did, everybody who was involved with the Flamin' Hot Cheetos, they all left or were promoted or they just disappeared. Huh. And there was nobody left to offer a rebuttal. Indeed, nobody cared. So he kept making the case and everybody said, well, I don't remember him, but eh, whatever. And it changed his entire life. And this was really, really interesting. Remember, he claimed that there were corporate backstabbers who were out to get him and people right. fought him every inch of the way. He was never in a single meeting about Flamin' Hot Cheetos. That's astounding. They apparently gave this task to a junior employee and she ran with it, named it, brought it to market the whole bit and then moved on. He was never in any of the meetings. Oh, my God. I'm so sad. It was such a good story. It was. And as an Irishman, I always tell people, never let the facts get in the way of a good story. But we always do say that we're going to come back and tell you when we were wrong. And, and Aunt, we were wrong. We were wrong. But I have to say that when we do report on the things we report on, we do check multiple sources. So I'm really surprised that that got past us. No, I'm not, because there was no way not to be wrong about this. If you were going to talk about this when it first became a story, there was no other source that would ever get you anywhere near curious. But we make good on our word. We tell you when we've made our mistakes, even if there was no other way to do it back yeah, when we Yeah, sorry made about that. So, <laughs> so here it goes in mea culpa. We'll put a link in the show notes to that episode. You can go listen to it and have a laugh. Now we got to go find that episode. You got to be kidding. <laughs> well, what I just said really is that Andrew Mount will have to go and find that episode. <laughs> one of our, probably our number one fan, Andrew Mount, who actually now works with us, is the self-made historian of Words and Numbers. So I'm sure she knows. We both have the memory of a sieve. Right. So yeah. <laughs> that, that. To get more of Ant and James, make your way over to Amazon.com, where for about the price of a cheap lunch, you can feast on our thoughts on economics and government as you read Cooperation and Coercion, How Busy Bodies Became Busy Bullies, and What That Means for Economics and Government. Cooperation and Coercion on Amazon. Sykes Wilford joins us this week. Sykes is a successful entrepreneur, and so we'll be hearing the typical things one hears from entrepreneurs about how they got where they are. But Sykes' case is unique in that he is a successful entrepreneur in an industry that over the past half century has shrunk by 98% and that the government has basically targeted for obliteration. Sykes is founder and CEO of Laudisi Enterprises, which includes Smoking Pipes and Smoking Pipes Europe, both online retailers of pipes and tobacco, Peterson and Cornell and Deal, both pipe tobacco manufacturing firms, and Low Country, a pipe and pipe tobacco brick and mortar business. Sykes launched his career by founding SmokingPipes.com in 2000 while completing his undergraduate degree in history at Vanderbilt. Sykes, welcome to Words and Numbers. Thanks for having me. Good to be here. We invited Sykes because I'm very busy. You have a son, isn't that correct, Sykes? Yes. I'm busy funding his college education at this point because <laughs> I buy so many things from Sykes and the good people who work for him that I'm probably in Dutch with the wife three out of every four weeks of the month. Sykes is, of course, you will all know by now, in the tobacco business, something I just love to pieces. So, Sykes, how on earth does a man get into the tobacco business? And it seems that not only did you get into it, you actually made something of yourself, right? You got a pretty good sized company with, I'm guessing, significant sales and a number of employees. Walk us through the sequence of events that led you to this point. So it started, I don't want to say accidentally, but I ended up in the tobacco business because I needed a part-time job in college. And I applied a handful of places, and I was at Ellison Place Pipe and Tobacco, two blocks from Vanderbilt's campus where I went to college. On the way out the door, I asked them, hey, are you all hiring? And they said, sure, can you start tomorrow? And so I did. <laughs> <laughs> and that started a love affair with pipes and pipe tobacco 22, 23 years ago. So I ended up in the business by accident. 
And of course, 22, 23 years ago, this was 98, 99, and the internet was also going to change everything. And of course it did. We just didn't know in what ways it would. And I started thinking, you know, this is something that could be done well, selling pipes specifically online. And I started smoking pipes a few months later in June of 2000. If my historical brain is working even a little today, you probably got started with this much at the same time the cigar boom was happening. This was post-cigar boom. So the cigar boom was winding down when I started this. Did you find you were able to capitalize on a market there that was drifting away from a product looking for maybe another one? Maybe. Pipes as an industry have been in steady decline since 1960. So you've gotten into the perfect business. <laughs> oh, yes. It's about, I don't know, 2 or 3% of the size it was 60 years ago. Wow. Yeah, not 2 or 3% smaller, 2 or 3% of. And so it's a pretty tiny niche little industry these days. And it was a pretty big industry. It seems to be relatively healthy, even if it's small. Those who are left seem to be particularly devoted. I think so. What we've seen happen in the last 10 or 15 years is a growth in the hobby end of the business where people are more engaged with the product and they're buying better product, both on pipes and pipe tobacco. They're more interested. They're more engaged. The customer base is much more like a hobbyist and much less like a cigarette smoker. Most pipe smokers 40, 50 years ago bought cheap mass produced pipes and put cheap mass market pipe tobacco in them. And that has certainly changed. The mass market has declined far more rapidly than the upper end of the market. I think the upper end of the market has not grown in the last 15 years. I tell people all the time that pipe tobacco is a really interesting product. It's a boutique market. There's all kinds of different answers out there. If I started smoking a different blend every week, I would never get to all of them. But didn't you think, what am I doing when you got into this market in the first place? I would like to ascribe some sort of real brilliance or prescience to that moment, <laughs> but it really came down to, there are these emerging technologies, which are cool, but I knew nothing about because I was a history major. And then pipes are cool, and I bet I can make something happen here. That's sort of how it started. That is absolutely the perfect entrepreneurial story. It's perfect. And you've grown, you have what, 25 employees now? We have about 150 employees. Oh my Lord. Wow. Oh my God. That's astounding. What's that feel like, knowing that there are a hundred or so people betting on you every day they go to work? Does it keep you up at night? It doesn't keep me up at night. It's been gradual. So it started with me and me, and then it was just me. And then it gradually grew to being just under 150, about 148 right now. It didn't happen all at once, so I'm sort of comfortable with it. It's something that I certainly think about and consider carefully where we're planning for the business. The U.S. government decided to wage a war on tobacco understandably with the cigarette companies hiding the health effects of cigarettes. But somehow it seems that pipes and cigars and now e-cigarettes have gotten tied up in this. They become targets. To what extent do you feel the government slowly squeezing out your market? Or do you? We do, is the short answer. To what degree is an ongoing question. Obviously, our behaviors have changed. Let me talk for a moment about our business. So we have the online retail, which James is a customer of Smoking Pipes, but we also have a tobacco factory in South Carolina, Cornell and Deal. And so for most of the recent government stuff, that's really where we've been focused because FDA primarily is regulating the manufacture of uh, tobacco, not its sale. And the stuff that it does on sale has not meant much to us yet. It's things like the age change from 18 to 21. We're like, okay, yeah. We sell pipes and pipe tobacco for a living. Our average customer is 50. This is not a big deal. <laughs> but on the manufacturing side, that has precipitated a lot of changes. And that's usually where we feel that pressure. The FDA recently, it, I don't know if this is a rule they put in place or they advised it, is the banning of the menthol cigarettes. James and I talked about this a couple of weeks ago, and we were scratching our heads trying to figure out why. Why ban menthol cigarettes? I could see banning cigarettes if that's your goal. What's your take on that? I think that there is a cultural impulse to make tobacco go away, and anything that makes it harder on tobacco is a win for certain groups. Many years ago, the menthol argument was, and this is still being made today by some people, is that if you ban menthol, it's a racist. This is the product of choice of millions of adult Americans, but the concentration is African American, and so you're singling those people out and banning their product. Now, the argument is the flip side. It's racist not to. And I'm not going to wade into that with any kind of personal opinion other than I kind of like menthol cigarettes. <laughs> so I'm going to be slightly personally disappointed 
But I think we've just come to this cultural place with tobacco that the impetus is to make whatever go away that we can make go away as a society. And by we, obviously, I don't include myself. But as a society, this is now becoming an imperative. So we're just going to boy at it however we can. We can't go whole hog because in 2009, Congress said you can't ban cigarettes. I think it was the 2009 Act. They said you can't just go out and ban cigarettes. So you're just going to chip away at it however you can. I wasn't aware of that Congress saying that you can't ban cigarettes. Did you know that one, James? No. But honestly, I don't pay a lot of attention to Congress and the crap it throws to the bureaucratic agencies. Mm -hmm. You have to wait for something like this to happen. When you look out and you see menthol cigarettes, and Sykes, I think you're exactly right. This is primarily a product sold to black Americans. And it does seem like they're being singled out a little bit here. But I wonder what's next. I always wonder what's next. And for all of the reasons that they're thinking about or they will ban menthol cigarettes, so too aromatic tobaccos. When you get something that tastes like cherries, I start to get a little worried for the people who enjoy that sort of thing. Of course. And that's happened at the state level in a number of states. You can't ship to three different states, right? I think it's more than three. I remember Washington being one of them. Washington's one of them. One of the Dakotas, I'm embarrassed to say that I can't remember which of the Dakotas. Maine is a third, and then there's one or two more. And the guys who live in these states are forever complaining that they just can't go get what everybody else in the country can get. And they try to figure out ways around it, but they're pretty well clamped down. And this, to me, seems like a real trend, something to be very concerned with. Rules at the state level are a concern for us. Now, in two of those cases, these are longstanding state laws about the import of tobacco period into the state. So there are federal rules that say you can't sell cigarettes, and then that was extended to include moist tobacco, or chewing tobacco. Mm -hmm. But they left it open for cigars and pipe tobacco. The Jenkins Act prohibit the mail order sale of cigarettes. I don't know when the Jenkins Act happened. It was amended in 2009. And it was extended to include moist tobacco, which is basically snuff like Copenhagen and things like that, and chewing tobacco. They left cigars and pipe tobacco out of that at that point. The states, of course, in some cases have extended their rules to include those things. And it's usually high tax jurisdictions, of course. How much of your day on average do you spend worrying about or dealing with compliance issues? So I have a pretty good team for compliance, and it's what I least like to do. So I do as little as possible. Last year in 2020, I probably spent 20% of my personal time on compliance issues. We have one woman in the office who it's all she does is tobacco compliance, state and federal. And then there are some assistants that help as these projects grow or shrink. It's a big thing for us. And the legal bills, of course, run to many tens of thousands of dollars per year. Yeah, this is the thing that's astounding to me. There was one politician that I read of recently, I can't recall his name, who spent much of his career in Congress and then left and started a business and said, oh my God, I had no idea the cost that we're imposing on businesses demanding all of this compliance of various things. And he said, it's so easy to write it into law of you have to do X, Y, and Z. But when it hits the road, it turns into, in your case, you've got to hire somebody to do this thing. You've got the legal bills that is really can be onerous. Yes. But to have one person devoted to this, I'm sure it happens in other businesses as well, but it's just astounding. It's like a slap in the face that you have to hire somebody whose sole purpose is to deal with government regulation. It's frustrating. I think the biggest challenge for us, I mentioned legal bills. These are not courtroom legal bills. These are just explaining the law to us legal bills and helping us figure out the right way to comply. So from a public policy perspective, it's frustrating, but it also creates barriers to entry. Having the ability to navigate the regulatory landscape creates competitive barriers. And this is bad for consumers and bad for the market, but it can be a benefit to the businesses that can comply. So looking at it, honestly, as a businessman, not through political ends, not looking at it as a consumer, but just looking at it as a businessman, it, it behooves me to think, okay, how do we make sure that we do a good job of complying? And how do we make sure that we know how to follow these rules? Because the business will end up flowing to us because we figured out how to navigate it. Right. You're operating within the environment that they put you in. Exactly. It's a position I find myself deeply uncomfortable with because I don't think it should be that way. I think that we should be able to bring our products to market and we should be competing on the quality of the product and what have you. But running a business and in industry like this perspective, there are advantages and disadvantages. I'm interested in going back to you say that the pipe market now is 2% of what it was back in the day. 
But the cigarette market, I'm sure, has shrunk, and I'm sure it hasn't shrunk that much. What's special about pipes that caused that change? Cigarettes. People shifted. Yeah. Pipe smoking was much more common through the first half of the 20th century, and mass-produced cigarettes become the way that people consume tobacco until the 20s. And then that was really solidified with World War II because cigarettes went in every fraction. So there was a big consumption shift from pipe tobacco and cigars among men to cigarette consumption. It's an easier product to use, and especially if you're off at a war, nobody's sending you pipe tobacco and a pipe in your rations. In the time you've been in the market, have you seen a bit of an uptick yet, or is it basically a flat line since you got into this? For us, it's been very good. We are strongest in the parts of the market that have been healthiest. The further up market you go, our footprint tends to be bigger. So it's been very good for us. And we've seen tremendous growth in the brands that we own, in the sorts of brands that Smoking Pipes carries. The industry as a whole has continued to shrink. The top end of the industry, so imported pipe tobacco, sort of boutique pipe tobacco. In the U.S., really, you're talking about Cornell and Dale. And then imported pipe tobacco has grown. Mass market domestically manufactured pipe tobacco has steadily declined. I do actually use your service quite a lot. And one of the things that I noticed straight away was that there's an emphasis with you guys with customer service. You provide a very high level of customer service. And I'm wondering how you got that in as part of your corporate mission. It smells like it's something you guys talk about quite a bit. It is. How were you able to put that so high on people's lists that, in my instance, I will cheerfully pay you guys a couple of more dollars for an order because I know I'm going to be cared for, and that matters? Companies say stuff like this all the time, but I want to say for us it's true that we take care of the customer, and that's just baseline. You order, we're getting it shipped same day. You call us, you don't wait on hold. You get answers fast, and you get them from people that are trained well to give you the right answer. I think customer service for so many industries, and some of this is the nature of the industry, it's easier maybe for us, but I think customer service for so many industries, there's a desire to break customer service down into little programmatic pieces. Customer service is not something we do that to. We pay really well for customer service. Customer service agents at Smoking Pipes aren't really like customer service agents elsewhere because we're paying more, we're training more intensively. These are not call center employees. They do not have scripts. The training process goes on for weeks and months. It's not, okay, here's your level one support person. Here's your script and have at. It's just very important to us that we get those customer experience things right. So you're a history major at Vanderbilt. You start a business round about the 9-11 recession in an industry that is 2% of what it used to be. And you make a go of it. <laughs> You've got 150 employees. You entered what any entrepreneurship professor would say is the perfect storm. <laughs> Don't ever do what you did. And yet you pulled it off. How did you do this? Some of it is we were lucky right before the 2001 recession. But that was also when online retail was becoming a thing. So we had some right. not first mover, but early mover advantages associated with being a thing that early in online retail in our industry. So that was one thing that worked out for us. We survived the first few years, and there were a number of early entrants that happened all about the same time, and they did not. So we were really the only major online retailer for pipes and pipe tobacco that had a presence, because no one had a serious presence in 1999 or 2000. So some of it is just being in the right place at the right time. I think we took pipes as a product really seriously, and when few others were, then we figured out how to scale it. Selling pipes and pipe tobacco is really knowledge heavy. There's a lot to know. There's a lot that's very specific to the industry. And there are not a lot of people that do it anymore. So it's not like it's knowledge heavy and there are 100,000 people in the U.S. that do this. And there's a vibrant community for it. Right. It's knowledge heavy. And there are just not that many people that work in the industry in the U.S. Figuring out how to grow past the first handful of people was a real challenge for us. And I think it was also for a number of our competitors. And we managed to do it and they did not. Sometimes people ask me this question, and I just have to say, it's because we didn't ever screw up that badly. <laughs> right. <laughs> we made sure. mistakes, yeah. but we never did anything so colossally stupid that it was business ending. Yeah. <laughs> I look back on it, and I think about the other businesses that were around in the early 2000s in this industry. They just didn't manage to navigate some combination of growing from being a micro business to a small business or managing the technological change or what have you. 
The other thing that we are very serious about is controlling our own technology, building our own software, and not cobbling together a bunch of third-party pieces of software to achieve different things. That doesn't mean we don't do it, but our instincts are to build in-house. We have 150 employees. Yes, we're an online retailer. We have two full-time software developers plus me. Huh. My degree is in history. At this point, if I had to go get a job, I would probably be hired as a database developer. If I had to go get a real job, that didn't sound like much fun. So we're very focused on business process and technology where the customer can't see it. Mm -hmm. The customer benefits from it. The customer hops on the website and sees recommended pipes based on their purchase history. Trying to touch the customer and improve the customer experience with technology without it ever feeling like that's what we're doing. I don't mean that in a hiding it, buried in our cookie policy sort of way. I mean in a, you call us, you don't get an automated one, two, three, four option, complicated queue where you end up not being able to ask the right question, give up and hang up. You don't get that experience but you do get customer service agents that have access to tremendous amounts of information and it's easy for them to find. For us, I think it's really about being focused on the customer experience, never doing anything to betray customer trust. Sykes, we're almost out of time, but something you just said is really, really interesting. I don't know if you know this, but Ant and I travel the country and we speak to high school students all the time. They're always concerned for their futures, of course. And one of the things that Ant likes to tell them and that I've become quite a fan of, he looks out and he says, listen, whatever you end up doing for a living, it hasn't been invented yet. There's going to be all kinds of new things between now and the time you end up in a career. So the best thing you can do is just prepare yourself to be open to it. It sounds to me like that's exactly how your whole life went. How does a history major end up running a very big pipe concern? Or you were ready for it in some way? I suspect maybe so. I'd never really thought about it in those terms. If I were advising these high school students, I would be an ardent champion for a broad liberal arts education and diverse skill sets and flexibility and ability to think and write clearly and speak clearly. I would be not so focused on whatever the hot new job trend is because it's not going to be that in 20 years. Right now, whether it's software engineering or pick something else for the library, like nursing or something like that with a lot of growth, that's true right now, but that also puts you in a pretty, software engineering, you're probably good. Nursing, you're also probably good for a while. (laughs) But I'm a big fan of broad liberal arts education and to a great degree what I got from Vanderbilt. I was a history major. I took economics classes. I took math classes. I took science classes. Given where my career has taken me, I wish I'd done more math and science. I think the big school over the next... 20, 30, 40, 50 years is going to be figuring out how to be good at learning stuff, not being good at something. We're lucky to be able to hang out with you a little bit today. So thanks yeah, this for chunking great. out a Thank little you. bit of your time. It has Thank you so it has much. been great. And Sykes, I hope our paths cross again out there. I really do. That's all the time we've got this week on Words and Numbers. Be sure to join us next week when we have even more fascinating things. Until then, follow us on Twitter. The handles are in the show notes. Send us email, words and numbers nope. podcast nope. at gmail.com. Don't send email. Join the Words and Numbers backstage Facebook group. Find us on Patreon where you can donate to our habit of our, making podcasts. Our habit of making podcasts. And for crying out loud, just be nice to each other. It doesn't take much. Have a great week. See you next week, James. James.